you know, so I'm super excited again about this conversation and it is um, so needed uh, because in our society today, earlier, you know, I uh, was watching the funeral of uh, George Floyd um, and I have two children. I have an eight-year-old and a um, six-year-old. And, uh, you know, I was watching it with both of them, you know, and uh, we were having a discussion about it, et cetera. So there's just a lot going on emotionally. Um, and uh, we're here to talk about it today, you know. Um, you know, we have a fantastic panel of gentlemen in um, education, in activism, and, um, you know, I want this conversation to be really engaging. So just to introduce myself, for those who don't know, I know that this is a um, public event. So my name is Jeff Lindor, and I'm the founder and CEO of The Gentleman's Factory, right? And uh, The Gentleman's Factory is a community for black and brown men. And, uh, you know, we have a um, social club in Brooklyn um, and as a result of COVID, you know, we then see, so how is it that we could um, expand our reach and provide um, a host of workshops, support, and a community to men of color all across the country and all across the world. So since over the past two months, you know, we've expanded. Uh, so now we're in 14 states and we're in four countries, right? And that just goes to the fact that, you know, black and brown men need to be connected and we need to talk and we need to share ideas and build with each other, right? So I'm super excited about um, today, you know, and as folks are trickling in, um, you know, I'll just introduce uh, the fantastic panel uh, that we have. And, um, you know, just some um, house rules, you know, Jason, who is our fantastic moderator for today, he's going to be leading the discussion. And uh, if you have um, questions, um, so we're going to do a more in-depth Q&A towards the end of the discussion. Uh, but if there's a pressing question that you have, please feel free to put it in the chat box. And, um, you know, we'll uh, try our best to, uh, you know, answer them, right? Um, so, uh, let me pull up the bios of these gentlemen here. And uh, after reading all of these bios, I then said to myself that I need to step my game up uh, and what exactly have I been doing with my life, right? You know, just seeing the great gentlemen here uh, today. Uh, but I wanna start off, as I pull it up, I wanna start off with our moderator for this evening. And for those who were a part of the first conversation, um, you know, about like three weeks ago, it was um, called uh, Raising, no, so it was the state of black boys, right? And um, Jason was the moderator there. And Jason, um, so I'm so happy to have him back and he's gonna be moderating today's discussion. So uh, Jason Ocasta is a proud native of the South Bronx and a product of New York City Public Schools. But guided by the question, who am I? Jason has dedicated his social work career to dismantling oppressive systems in an effort to create equitable spaces for people of color. Jason leads by utilizing a system lens to empowering the community and impact urban education while advocating for institutional change. Jason shares his experience of many educational platforms, including national conferences, schools, and higher education. Jason is a social worker, educator, entrepreneur, an adjunct professor, co-host of Live from the Bronx podcast. Make sure you all subscribe to that podcast, right? Uh, and the podcast celebrates Bronx creative in creativity and change makers. And Jason is a proud graduate of uh, Marist College, and he also has his master's in social work from Fordham University. Round of applause for Jason, everyone. Ah! Right, um, Jim St. Germain, uh, Jim, um, again, also really great friend. Jim, I'm not gonna read his bio because, <laughs> because <laughs> Jim wrote his bio in his memoir called The S A Stone of Hope, where he goes in deep dive. Uh, about his experience, right? And Jim has a very powerful story. And then Jim would, um, you know, share it all with you. Um, Jim um, is an author. He's a nonprofit leader. 
Uh, he's an advocate and um, he is also a filmmaker. So, you know, a couple of months ago, I had the honor of seeing the short film uh, featuring Michael K. Williams um, at Michael K.'s house with Jim, where we were um, taking a look at it. And um, this film is called Father's Day. And um, Jim will um, speak a little bit more about it. So Jim, you know, I'm super excited to have you on here. And last but not least, oh man, so this brother, oh man, you know, I'm um, honored to even know him, right? Like he and I go way back and I love the great work that he is doing in Coney Island. Uh, uh, but Leslie Bernard Joseph, who's born in Brooklyn, New York, and raised in Queens. Leslie Bernard Joseph is an educator, attorney, and a social impact leader. He is the chief executive officer of Coney Island Prep, a free public K-12 charter school serving over 1,000 scholars across three campuses. Founded in 2009, each of Coney Island Prep's first three graduating classes boasted 100% college acceptances, right? Leslie began his career teaching fifth grade in the Bronx through Teach for America before joining the founding team of Coney Island Prep as the school's first dean of students. That's actually when I met um, Leslie. That was probably like 10 years ago. 30 years ago, right? No, no, let me stop. Um, he has also worked as an associate at the law firm Scatton Arpslet. So, my, so Leslie needs to help me with my um, reading, right? You know what I mean? Scatton, right? Um, and as an associate at the management consulting firm McKenzie and Company, another place where Leslie and I partner. Um, um, and as a managing director at Harlem Children's Zone, where he led a portfolio of eight programs serving approximately 4,400 students across HCZ's 12, K-12 pipeline. Leslie served, Le Leslie received his AB in politics and African American studies from Princeton, where he served as both student body. Man, and I'm trying to unmute myself. You really don't have to read this whole thing. You really oh, no, 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 man. Nah, man. Nah, nah, nah. I'm almost finished. Man. Nah, I'm bro. here typing, trying to get, I'm like, Dave, can we nah, stop? Nah, nah, man, you can, bro. You can, bro, right? You know, uh, two more lines, right? Uh, uh, student body and black student union president and he also holds a JD with distinction from Stanford Law School and a master's in education from Stanford School of Education. While at Stanford, Leslie was the 2013 Paul and uh, Diasara Fellow. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the fantastic panel. Jason, take it away. Thank you all. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone joining us. I'm super excited to be here. We are going to have some real deep discussions today. We want to learn more about our panelists and who they are and the work that they do, but also have some conversations about our current state and what all this means for our young Black boys and our, and our, and our Black men. Um, so please uh, just want to reiterate what Jeff was saying. We will have some time towards the end to have uh, Q&A, but feel free to engage with each other. Feel free to type in questions, and depending on what time looks like, and if questions are, are uh, related to some of the things that we're talking about, you know, I'll have my eye on there and see how we can pull those out, but keep in mind that Q&A at the end will take place. So with, without further ado, let's jump right into it. Jim and Leslie, what is going on, fellas? How are you doing, and how are you feeling? Oh. Well, um, I'm all right. I'm all right. Um, I don't necessarily know how I'm feeling because I'm feeling a lot of things. And um, obviously everything that's happening in the world, as we know, but I've also recently lost my father to COVID-19. Um, wow. Just 58 years old. So, and I have a son who's seven that I have to explain um, why his chocolate skin is... Um, is inherently a crime in this country and those are there are no words for that um you know 
as a black father, you guys know what that's like. So um, I'm all right, man. I'm all right. Yeah, I just want to send my condolences and, and, and thank you for being here with us despite everything that's happening. Um, you know, and, and a lot of people who are, who are being affected by this, man. Um, so, so, you know, truly thank you from the bottom of my heart, man. And um, look forward to, to, to learning more about you too. Yes, Leslie. Sir. Um, echo that, Jim. Sorry for your loss. Hundred percent. Um, thank you guys for having me for being here. Um, Jeff, definitely proud to proud to be doing the work with you. Proud to be here. Um, I am feeling. Uh, I feel like I have just a very short fuse mm. everywhere. Yep. Um, uh, and I feel like far less in control of my emotions than I normally would be. And mm. I think as many on the call could attest, like that feels dangerous as, as a black man, just so on the good and the bad, like I feel like quicker to laugh just cause I need it. Um, definitely have cried more in the past week than I expected or would have wanted to. Um, I feel like I'm being more short with people. And so I feel like I have a short fuse and I'm trying to get back to what feels like a sense of like an even cadence for me, but uh, I'd be lying if I didn't say I was struggling day to day or minute to minute, hour to hour. Um, but appreciative of like being around this group, um, being around folks I haven't met yet. Um, thankful for some familiar faces on the call. My cousin is on this call. Nice to see you, Megan. We got some Coney Island Prep staff on the call. How you doing, Iman? Um, so appreciative of the familiar faces for sure. Thank you. Thank you as well for sharing that. Um, definitely some tough times. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but before I even, before we even jump into the next question, super random, but I admire the kick game in the back. I see the ones, the 11s, the Jays. Hey. Shout out to you. Hey. <laughs> uh, big sneaker guy. My, 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 my sneaker game is not that good, but the one in the middle, the black one, what is that? Space Jam. Space Jam 11s. Got you. Okay, okay. I want those when we're done, when we're done with this um, panel. Yeah, I think those are my size, though. <laughs> Yeah, man. So, uh, you know, I, I, I'm, a, I'm about to speak a game of the swag. So appreciate it. Appreciate that, too. Have, be having that in the background. So, fellas, we heard all about your uh, bio and, and your, the many hats that you wear and all the great work that you're doing. But how do you identify? Tell, tell folks who, a little bit about who you are and, and, and what that means for you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I, I'm Haitian. Uh, I'm Haitian and um, when you're Haitian, that, that, that is, um, uh, that's a special, it's a special thing where we're from. Um, it's a very, um, long and storied, um, and rich history in the story that, you know, we're from as the first, um, group of enslaved Africans to abolish and get rid of, um, slavery you know, um, our history overall in terms of not just only abolishing slavery in Haiti, but helping to do the same all over South America and being that beacon of hope for the world. Um, and obviously we've been crushed for that ever since. But, you know, I identify myself um, as a sort of like born revolutionary. And I don't mean that in the sense of um, sort of like just a jargon, but I mean it that I see my life as the most precious gift that I can give to others. My struggles, the beauty that comes with it, the strength, um, you know, the reality which we have to deal with in this world. Um, I see us as being most human. Um, I think we're the closest to what it's like to be human. And, and a lot of times I like to think that that's what those who hate us are jealous of, is our soul and how beautiful we are and how we can pretty much, pretty much make something out of anything. And so I, I identify myself as that. I, I, I struggle with titles. I don't like bios. That's why Jeff is always telling me my bio sucks. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I struggle with those things. Um, I just see myself as a person who's responsible for just leaving the world just a little bit better 
for my son. Mm -hmm. Love that. Thank you for sharing that. Leslie. Yeah. Uh, Haitian American as well. Um, but I was born here, born in Brooklyn, grew up in Queens. Um, yeah, I think that that's sort of the most important in terms of where I identify myself. But other than that, I would say um, a lot of what you said, Jim, definitely resonates. I think in terms of being Haitian, it is definitely um, special kind of blackness. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, growing up in the States in particular, I would say I definitely uh, had to learn how to take pride in my heritage. Um, it wasn't always something that just sort of came naturally growing up where I came up. Um, sure. But for sure, I would say, other than that, I would say definitely want to acknowledge the privileges in my identity. I'm a cisgendered, heterosexual male, mm -hmm. um, Christian. So there's still definitely a lot of dominant parts of my identity. Um, definitely trying to learn how to manage that and sort of uh, manage the places where my privilege shows up for sure. But other than that, mm -hmm. grew up like many of us, I'm sure did, single parent household um low-income circumstances and then just got tremendous educational opportunities so i always feel like i've been between worlds right not just being haitian and black or black and american but um, two worlds in so many different ways mm, thank you for sharing that just, just off hearing a little bit about your identity identity and how you um describe yourselves, right? I think we, we, we don't have time to get too deep into this, but one thing I do want to emphasize on is the ways in which our identity markers come together to help us uh, with the way we perceive the world and society, right? I think a lot of us don't take time to really think about, are there identities that we have that give us privilege? Are there identities that we have that further marginalize us? And what does all this mean um, as I walk through society, right? So conversation for another time, but important to emphasize and think about for everyone. Um, so thank you both for, for bringing those pieces up about your identity. My next question for you is, we're all here today um, to have a discussion, not only just about your upbringing and your stories, but what, that also, what it also means to raise black boys in today's world, right? Yeah. So when you hear that title, what comes to mind for you? Well, uh, I, I, I'll tell you, um... I'll tell you an experience I had two nights ago. Um, my son, who will be seven on Saturday, um, really, really precious kid. I'm biased. This is my son. I'm saying that, but I truly mean it. Kind, thoughtful, curious, just, just a beautiful boy. Um, and he's growing up much differently than I did. I, you know, I grew up in, I grew up in dire poverty, man. I mean, no running water. Um, a thin roof shack, you know, when it rains, the water comes right into our small place and there's mud on the floor. Um, you know, if we had one meal per day, then that was, that was a good day. Um, I remember as a kid, I used to stand in front of a bucket of water in the back of our house in Haiti. And me and some of my friends were looking inside the bucket of water and we we're looking at our reflections because we didn't have mirrors either. And then we would imagine that's us watching TV. So that's the, that's the world I grew up in as a, as, a, as a kid. And my son is having a completely different reality. Um, never had to go hungry, has a lot more than I've ever you know, had. I mean, the kid already on stocks. I, I just learned about stocks maybe two, two years ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, great education, amazing mother. So his, Childhood in, in many ways is different than mine, but then despite all of that, he is a black boy in this country. And that's something that I've been trying to shield him as much as possible, whatever that means. So despite me being open with him, we've always had honest conversations, me and my son. I mean, ever since he was two weeks old, I've always talked to him as, in, as if I was talking to an adult, because I understand um, that language and the way I talked to him mattered a lot. Um, and, you know, when all of these things are happening in the world with racism and police violence and um, the challenges which we face, he would ask questions and I would give him sort of like the surface answer and always hoping that, okay, at some point, I know I got to go deep with him, but right now, let me just 
I deal with it. I'm just going to allow him to be, just be this mm -hmm. happy boy. Well, two nights ago, we're talking. He said to me, Dad, did you hear what happened with George Floyd? First of all, I, I just, I froze right there, right? Because I knew it was coming, right? I knew the day was coming. And he said, uh, he said, you know, it's really wrong. It's really wrong what happened to him. And then he said to me, what is going to happen with those cops? You know, why, why did they do that to him? And I didn't have answers for him, so I kept asking him more questions. Um, and then he said to me, oh, by the way, Dad, I think the reason why COVID-19 killed so many people is because Donald Trump doesn't care about people. He only cares about money. Mm -hmm. um, this kid is turning seven on Saturday. And I'm not talking about words like baby words. He's telling me he was clear, he was precise, he was resolute um, and, and, and introspective. And I didn't know what to do, man. I, 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 how do you tell your heart when you have, when you're a parent, I don't know if, if any of you guys are parents, but any parents on this call know that your child is your heart. Um, and when you, it's sort of like you have your heart walking out in the middle of traffic. Um, that's how you see your child. And when that child is a black boy, times that by a billion percent. Mm -hmm. And um, so that, that, that reality hit me and I'm still processing it. And that's on top of losing my dad, which is his grandfather, which I also have to explain to him. He knows his grandfather is no longer here, but he doesn't fully, fully get that. He's not going to see him again completely. Um, so, you know, the moments are challenging and I wake up every day thinking that, okay, I'm going to make $2 million as fast as I can. And I'm going to move to Haiti and I'm going to build a house and that's where we're going to live. And then obviously other times I think, well, uh, maybe he won't love Haiti, but I'll send him to London. You know, at least he'll go there for college and live there. And the fact that the police in London do not have guns, the gun culture there is nowhere near like it is here. I think to myself, maybe if this kid gets into an interaction with a police officer, at least he'll get to live another day. I mean, these are the things that you have to think about as a black father. And this country is his country and he has as much rights to it than anyone else, um, you know, excluding Native Americans. I'm so, these are really difficult and challenging conversations to have with a child and, and they're painful. And, and I also have to, you know, tell them that, well, the white people, you know, who are my friends, they're this. And then I got to, on the other hand, tell them that, yes, there are people who are white who will certainly hate you just simply because the way you look. Um, yeah, man, it's confusing. It's confusing. And, and I don't have all the words. And so what I try to do with my son is, listen to him as much as possible um, and ask him as many questions as possible. So I hope that answers that. And, uh, that's deep, man. Thank, thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you for being vulnerable and telling us your, your story and the situation and, and the experience with your child. Um, I, don't, I don't have children. I don't know what that feels like, um, but I only hear the stories of, of my peers and my colleagues and those who are close to me and they share similar sentiments. So um, you know, we we are going to talk a little bit more about this a uh, little later in the panel, but I do want, um, you know, to share my sentiments, and I can only imagine what this, this experience is like, um, especially, you know, we're going to talk about your story, but ex especially having gone through some of those similar challenges as, a, as, as an adolescent, right? Um, Leslie, uh, do you want to, do you want to jump in and, and add anything to that? What, what, what comes to mind when you hear the, the title Raising Black Boys? Yeah, I'll be really quick. I think, Couple of things come to mind. I would say danger, power, privilege, and fearlessness. I think the danger part feels clear to all of us right now. I think the danger part has all always felt clear to us. Um, but I think from the perspective of kids right now, from young people right now, from young men right now, there's a power and fearlessness to it that I think um, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about like what's different in their circumstances growing up that was different mm -hmm. from when I grew up. Our kids right now, they, I think to the point about your son, Jim, they are fully aware. Yeah. They are fully aware that the world today does not appreciate their skin color, does not value their contributions, does not see their genius and their brilliance. 
and our kids today are fearless and in the face of it, they're like, yeah, I know that. And I can only be me. So I'm still going to laugh. I'm still going to smile. I'm still going to dance. I'm still going to find joy. Like there is, there's a sense of like fearlessness and protest. I think I'm not a parent. I see parents every day who are like, I'm afraid to let my, my child do X. And there's so many times where I'm having to tell them like, your, your child is approaching the world right now as if there's endless possibility. And we can't take that away from them. Like our kids right now are saying, yep, the world looks like this. So please believe I'm gonna go out and protest or please believe I'm gonna do whatever it is that I can to live the way that I want to. And I think part of that is just, they see different images from us, right? We, I didn't see black superheroes when I grew up. Like you can see this Black Panther mask over my shoulder. Like they just have different touch points. And so I think our kids are very much approaching this from the sense of like, yes, I know the world is like this, but it was like that when you grew up too. So we're going to do this our way. We're going to make our voices heard. And it doesn't matter how you experience the world. We're going to experience it our way. Because no matter what, I could die tomorrow. So I might as well be happy. Mm -hmm. So in so many ways, I just respect this, just the different freedom and spirit of protest that our young people are approaching the world with, especially our Black boys. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. One thing I want to emphasize on, um, and I mentioned this during the first panel we did um, that Jeff, men Jeff mentioned early in his introduction. So there's a book uh, written by Bettina Love, We Want to Do More Than Survive. I recommend everyone who is here with us um, it, at this event to read it. And the reason I'm mentioning this book is because she has a chapter where she uh, heavily emphasizes um, the power of hashtags. And she talks about hashtag Black Boy Joy. She talks about uh, hashtag black girl magic. And as she's talking about this, she's talking about the, the power and resiliency that people of color have, and particularly black people, in being able to come to, to get through all these different challenges, all the different things that they're experiencing and still find happiness in that. And um, you know, I just wanted to throw that out there because it is something that I think we do need to, to think about, right? What does it mean to dream? And what does it mean to still have the permission to dream and the opportunity to dream um, where many of us sometimes feel like it's stripped away from us. So we'll, we'll, we'll come back to this, but I did want to plug in that book based on what you were saying, Leslie. So um, thank you both for sharing that. So with that, do, I do want to take a, a step back a little bit and um, I'll, I'll uh, sorry, really quickly, I'll type in the name of the book um, as, as Leslie and Jim are responding. I saw one of the questions was, uh, what's the name of the book again? But coming back to you both, uh, Leslie and Jim, can you tell us a little bit more about your upbringing? What was your adolescence like? What were some of the challenges you experienced? And were there inter interactions with police officers? If so, what was that like? Yeah, I, um, it was interesting for me because I, again, I, I'm, I'm an immigrant. I was, I was born in Haiti. And as a kid in Haiti, um, I thought that America was going to be like home alone, right, or Kevin. Um, mm. that the, the hardest job we were going to have is keeping Joe Pesci out of our $2 million homes. Um, and, and that's just what it means to be a kid. And when you see these images, wherever you see them of America, you see the American dream, right? You see white picket fans and you see a fridge full of food and you see white families laughing and smiling and you're a child, you don't know anything. And then I landed here, I moved into Crown Heights and literally on the first 10 minutes <laughs> of walking through the building, um, I knew that this wasn't home alone and it was more like the wire. Um, and I had to adapt fast and quick as, you know, Leslie talked about earlier. I, I'm a very sensitive person. Um, and you know, there are a lot of things that we had to maneuver through. And one of them was being Haitian, right? People would call me Haitian booty scratches and say certain things about me. Um, first day in school i got into a fight with another boy and then the drugs the violence the ever-present police presence in the community um you know we live across from the orthodox jewish community but it was a completely different world it was insulated from mm -hmm. everything else and we all lived on top of each other and again as a child who's not from this country your brain is like, what is happening here? You know, why is mm -hmm. there so much violence, so much drugs, so much police, broken schools? And like, what is this? What is this experience? You know, what is it that I was promised that I'm coming to? 
And then unfortunately, I gravitated towards the wrong side of that community. Now, granted, there were a lot of people where I grew up who were working hard, going to school, doing what they had to do, um, finding a way through the mud in some ways to make something out of themselves. But, but it was really hard. And unfortunately, I wasn't one of those youngsters. I was on the opposite end of the track and um, ended up starting hustling at a, at a young age, right? I sold sneakers, I sold Jordans that I wanted. Um, you know, I sold Chinese food that I wanted and I, there was no nothing else around me. So I started selling weed as, as a young man and that led me into a deeper path. And by the age of 15, mm. I was locked up in the juvenile justice system where I served three years. And while there is really where um, my life changed. And uh, I read three books that changed my life when I got into the system as a kid. The first was a book called The Pack. It's about these three young men who grew up mm -hmm. in Newark, New Jersey, whom um, journeys resembled mine so much, right? So through mm -hmm. them, I was able to live this vicarious life in some ways. And the second book, and to me, the greatest piece of literature ever written is The Autograph of Malcolm X. Mm. Absolutely changed my life. Just turned my life upside down. Um, and the third book was Dreams from My Father, which is then Senator Obama's um, memoir. And, and in all those books, what I found at the time was the ability to read about men who've struggled like I did, but yet still somehow find a level of resiliency that they were able to use as a shield to carry them through this world. And I noticed there was these commonalities between all of these men. And what that common thing was, was that they weren't supposed to make it, mm -hmm. right? I mean, that's something that is very much regular vocabulary where we're from, that we weren't supposed to make it. Um, meanwhile, that term is almost never used in the white, in the European American community. Um, so for me, that was the experience growing up as a kid and losing friends to the streets. Man, I, 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 if I write a list of how many friends I lost before the age of 21, I run out of space. Um, both friends I grew up with and, and, and young men that I've worked with over the years as doing this work um, as a passion of mine. So my childhood was tumultuous, man. And, and in many ways, it was probably a lot worse than the time I had as a kid in Haiti. In Haiti, my struggle was strictly economics, right? Like if I had some food to eat, if I had a mango, if I had sugar cane, whatever it was, I'm happy I jumped in the, ri the river and life is all good. Whereas here, it was that and everything else. Um, mm. So that childhood really shaped me as you spoke about identity earlier. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I find myself, even though I'm in a completely different space now, I'm still very much that 14 year old boy. So mm -hmm. um, the goal is to give as much as I can back to the young people that I come mm -hmm. across, um, my, my younger brothers and younger sisters, and trying to pull the best out of that 14 year old boy not refine it and make it clean, but give it to them in a way which is accessible and that they can use so they don't have to make some of the mistakes that I've made as a young man. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Leslie, do you want to chime in on that? A little uh, bit about your, your adolescence, et cetera. Sure. I, uh, so I grew up very aware of class, class differences. Um, uh, my mom, Haitian immigrant, one of seven kids and almost all of her brothers and sisters were doctors, two parent households. Um, and I did not have that growing up. Mm. And so forget the home alone households. Like I saw, I grew up seeing like mansions and couldn't understand mm -hmm. why we, we did not have that. We had an apartment. Mm. Um, and so I think at a really young age, like I had, my mom was just telling me like, you know, nothing is fair in this life. And so I had this like childlike quest to like make things fair. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember vividly the day I came back home from school in eighth grade and our front door to our apartment was 
completely bashed in, looked like something out of a horror movie. Um, and I would learn from my mom that basically our landlord had sold the house. That was our new landlord's way of evicting us. So at 13 years old, um, I didn't know much, but I knew we definitely did not have a place to live. And I remember thinking, I was like, well, I got cousins houses who, you know, they live in these huge places like this. Somebody's going to take us in. And that did not happen. And that was sort of a rude awakening for me growing up. We, uh, it was four of us and we ended up moving to a different family member's house, different uncle's house in New Jersey. And so we were all sleeping on the floor. Definitely different experience from Queens. Um, so I think all of that for me growing up, I was like, the world doesn't, the world doesn't respond to you in the way that you think it should. Um, things that you think are supposed to be fair don't exist. People mm -hmm. who have means don't always uh, share it. Um, and so I think for me, it just started this idea of, well, how do you make the world fair? And I think if you add to that a combination of my mother always sort of having me zigzagging across Queens, trying to find all these different schools for me. I was in my third public school by third grade. I was getting bust outside of my district. Um, hour plus on the city bus for middle school. I ended up in boarding school for uh, high school. Um, for me, just constantly seeing the differences between those two worlds, I think is what motivated me to go back in education and sort of uh, not bridge the gap, but not bridge a gap, but just completely eradicate and eliminate it. Thank you on mute, Jay. <clears throat> All right, thank you for that. Sorry about that uh, technical difficulty piece right there. Um, so thank you both for sharing a little bit about your own history. So if we fast forward to where you are today, some of the leadership work you're doing. Leslie, I want to stay with you for a second. Um, you were out there protesting, right? You are in a, in, in a leadership position as CEO of Pony Island Prep. We're going to talk more about that in a sec. But what did it mean for you to wear your Stanford jacket, which I think is such a powerful symbol, um, given everything you said, but also so much that you've accomplished over, over your career, and be out there on the front lines protesting. What was that like for you? What was your experience? Yeah, I think the first word I'll use is cathartic. Um, I needed, I didn't realize how much I needed to experience that and to just have that release. Mm -hmm. I think it was just personally calming and freeing and and I think not just being around like like-minded people but just sort of having the opportunity to just be as angry as I wanted to be as loud as I wanted to be and just as frustrated as I wanted to be um that mattered a lot for me um I think for, for me it was it was it was also a visual display I think of both forms of privilege and and owning my space in the world and saying like, yes, I'm dressed in all black with uh, Jordans and a snapback hat. And I look like all of the things that would look intimidating to you with a black glove. Um, but I'm also an attorney. Um, mm. And just sort of, I think, complicating that image for police officers, right? To just look them in the face and then ask them critical questions and then ask why they were doing that and then walk away. And you see on the back of my jacket, like, yeah, I went to one of the best law schools in the country. And so from the front, from what you see, it looks very much like a threat, but um, I could have just as easily been working aside, beside you as a prosecutor or you know, against you as a criminal defense attorney, or I could be defending you or supporting your family or helping you buy a house or whatever it is. Um, but I also just happen to be, you know, depending on who you are, could be the leader of the school that your, your child attends. Um, mm. And I think for me, part of part of being out there, what I think was just showing off blackness in all of its glory and in all of its rage. Um, mm. So I don't know. I, I I I don't think I've always been the person who's like I have to go out and protest. There, I think there are many different ways that you can have a, that you can contribute. And I think if you were able-bodied and privileged, like, yeah, go out and protest, but not everybody can do that. And I respect that. But for me, I think it was more about just, just dealing with like the mental stress of this in a way that finally felt positive to me. Thank you for sharing that. 
one thing that that we know just by watching history right and um many unfortunately many of the injustices that we've experienced is we experience over time we we've always seen young people on the front lines leading the charge high school students college students um right out there uh, uh fighting fighting for what they believe in and so as we think about that 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 also comes with a lot of not only just responsibility but trauma and um what what when you when you're out there or where when we know that our young people are on the front lines like especially our young black boys and our young black men like what do we say to them how do we support them um knowing that not only are, may they be taking a risk but it's something that they're fighting for and they truly believe in what 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 kind of advice can we give them and how do we support i i think i think um as a this is coming from a person who's <laughs> i talk a lot um, but what I try to do with young people a lot of time is listen to them. Um, I mean, I love young people, man, like on a whole nother level. I mean, I love my younger brothers and sisters, like, um, and wherever I see them, I make sure that they know that whether it's a smile, whether it's like, a nod, I see you. Um, I just want them to feel that love for me. And I think, unfortunately, one of the things this country has done to us is, and in addition to everything it has done to us, is that sometimes it places us in these positions where we have to make Hobson's choice, where mm -hmm. the best choice is not even a choice. And so a lot of times we walk around each other, we see each other as the enemy. We've been taught that whether it's through films, through books, through media, whatever it is, through music, that's how we approach each other a lot of times. Um, and I remember it growing up, right? Like, I don't even have to know you. If I'm from the Heights, you're from bed style, I see you, I'm ice grilling you and then it's problem. I mean, just think about that mentality for such beautiful and loving people as we are. But that's what America has done to us in many ways. Um, that's what the trauma has done to us. So, my goal is to ensure that I approach them with love, curiosity, and I have really high standards for my kids. And when I say my kids, I'm talking about any young person I walk into in the streets, wherever I am, whatever they need, I got them. Um, I don't hesitate to hand, hand a young person my, my number, my email, whatever that thing is, I want to be available to them. And as you said earlier, Leslie, our kids know their power. Um, there's a reason why the whole world is pillaging everything that we produce. There's a reason why hip hop is the number one genre in the world. So on one hand, the world hates us. On the other hand, the world wants everything that we have and they always wanted it. Um, and so I want our youngsters to know that. I want them to know the power they carry and I want them to walk up with their head held high, um, knowing who they are. And I think, it's really hard to shape their values and their morals if they are centered and know who they are and where they come from. Can I, can I flip that? Yes. Uh, not what you're saying, but like the question, uh, Jason. Um, of course. I think, uh, I think young people right now are deeply skeptical of adults. Yeah. Mm. What, what could we possibly tell them when we have set this world on fire, like what, what do we what do we have to tell them? Don't don't dress like this, stand like this, wear your hat like this. You don't know your history. It's, you know what? They may not know their history, but they definitely understand this world. So I think I think when if and when you approach young folks and tell them what they need to hear, I think folks turn off, and I think we do way too much talking at young folks and i think to your point jim not enough listening so i actually want to flip the question and say um i'm seeing in this little square right now lakeisha adams i think is 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 on this call and she got a little young man between her um like my man like i see you chilling you look like a strong dude with your shirt off like this is not us talking to you like what do you like what do you want to hear like what do you expect to hear? why are you on this call like this is not about us like I'm not some wise person who knows everything. In fact, when I was your age, I've been like, man, look at this old cat. 
These sneakers <laughs> are behind me for a reason. These sneakers are not behind me for y'all. It's for kids that I'm on the screen with every day. So I'm more interested in like hearing from you, like mm-hmm. how are you experiencing this world? Like what do you need from us? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's such an important question to oh, think hold about. On, some, hold on, hold on. Somebody gotta unmic, somebody gotta unmute Lakeisha Adams so we can actually hear from at least one young brother on this call about what exactly oh. happened. Because this is not, there we go. This is not Let's about do it. Let's do it. So the right. question was like, what do young people, what do you say to young people? Like, no, no, no. what do you want to hear? What are you, look- your question? What do you uh, need from us? Hi, Lakeisha. Hey, Jam. You see, I got the team here. Hey, I, you know, I love you. You know, we run deep. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, young brother. I know, I know your mom. Go ahead, hit us up. Uh, my name is Chris, by the way. Uh, How you doing, Chris? Well, you said the, your question was, what do I want to hear, right? Or like, what do I want adults to tell me? Yep. Well, what do you need us to do for you? Well, well, my mom, she's really, she's really like, she's 100%. So it's not like she, she doesn't really sugarcoat anything. So it's not like, you know, since I was born, she was telling me, you're black, be proud in your, in your blackness. So I, I was like, grow, I, I was grown up knowing that I was black and that, you know, this reality of the world and not everybody likes you because of your skin. And it's very unfair, mm-hmm. but it's what we have to live with I'm, until it changes. We can't really change it. So we can't change it. Well, we can change it, but. It, it, it still takes, it, it will still take time. Yeah. I love vacation. <laughs> Trust me, I know her. She used to come upstairs on my floor where I work and tell me what to do. So <laughs> all good stuff. Thank you, Lakeisha. But um, since my mom has been really like real with me, what I need people to tell me personally is just like how it is. You can't really sugarcoat anything. Mm-hmm. Uh, because if people grow up with false, with false mindsets, they they act on things and they don't they don't do it mm. correctly because mm. they've been they they've grown up with this false image of who they are or what they're doing is right. Um, so personally, for me, I think that uh, um, everybody should be. Black or white, doesn't really matter the race. It should be, uh, you know, grown up with the mindset of the, like, just keeping it, keeping it 100. Mm. Because you can't really tell a white kid, oh, you don't have privilege because mm-hmm. you're white. Mm. Mm. So it's not like, oh. What you did uh, that? So you're it's brilliant. Like, you're brilliant. Yeah. I like wow. Jeff, I think you have the wrong person on the call, man. That young brother needs to be speaking, not me. <laughs> no respect. Like, I, I do think, Chris, I think what you're saying is powerful in part because there are so many times where I think we, we, a lot of the rhetoric is about like, how do we protect our young people and how do we shield our kids? Mm-hmm. And it, it is the cruel reality of, of America that we, we don't get to, right? Yeah. Tamir Rice is 12 years old, Tamir Rice wasn't doing anything. And so, I think especially in times like this, there's often calls for hope. And mm-hmm. I was honest. I sent a letter to our high school kids and I was like, I got to be honest right now. I feel really numb. And I, I'm not surprised and I expect this from this country and I'm really struggling right now. Like, I don't, I don't have any hopeful words for you. Yeah. The only thing I know is that I, I love you guys and I'm going to fight for you and I'm going to fight with you, but I'm not going to promise you that I'm not going to promise you something that the people before me couldn't promise. I'm just going to promise you I'm going to try, and I'm going to try with you. Chris, Chris, I, I, I'll tell you this, man. I, obviously, nothing that you've said surprised me because I know your mother really well. Um, so, you know, uh, if I met you in the streets and I didn't know you were her son, you'd start talking. I probably could have guessed whose son you were. That's how special your, your mother is. Um, but you just taught me something, and it's something that I've been struggling with a lot, right? As I've mentioned earlier, Chris, is that I, I try to, to sort of like preserve my son's innocence, even though I know I can't do it. Um, but there is a part of me that wants to. And 
you know, um, what you've just taught me is that I, I have to be real with him and tell him as it is. Um, mm -hmm. Because as Leslie said earlier, he knows already, as I've mentioned earlier, my son, who's about to be seven, Chris had a conversation with me as you having with me now, um, telling me about the things he feels and the things he's experiencing regarding what's going on in the world. So I think what you just did for me is, you know, you, you gave me affirmation to continue having these um, straight talk with him and, and let him know how the world is while loving him um, generously as much as possible. So I just want to thank you for that. You know, um, Just want to just want to say thank you to Lakeisha, Chris. Thank you for allowing us to put you on the spot and engage in this conversation. Um, so we we really appreciate that, Leslie, Jim. Thank you for taking the lead in that, right? And, and Leslie, uh, really modeling what it is that you're talking about, because I think that that is one of the biggest challenges that we just see, right? Especially when we talk about education, us uh, feeling that we're in these positions of authority and telling our young people what what we think is best for them. So um, Folks that are listening, man, definitely think about what just happened and the need to um, listen to our young people and, and what they're experiencing and what they're seeing because they know, right? And sometimes uh, the other thing you mentioned, Leslie, is, is we, don't, we don't know what to say. We don't know what to do. Um, and that's okay. And so how do we also just remind ourselves that that's okay? Um, you know, I've, I've had a couple of phone calls in the past few days with folks who have lost people and... Um, you know, are going through a lot of different things. And I say the same, same thing to them. It's just like, you know, it, it's okay not to have the most encouraging words in the, the words in the world at the moment. Allow yourself to live in the moment and process what's happening. And um, I think it, it's something that is, is needed. Uh, and we don't want to become numb, right? I think, unfortunately, this tends to happen um, often. But we don't, I think sometimes when, when, we, when that happens to us, we sometimes normalize the inequities and uh, we, there's like this fine balance between that that we want to make sure we also um, remind, consistently remind ourselves of, right? It's not normal to see these inequities. It's not normal for, for, for uh, people of color and Black folks in particular to be targeted by police, right? It's not normal for you not to have access to quality education, et cetera. So I think that um, the, uh, I just wanted to reemphasize and reiterate on some of these things because I think um, it, it's extremely necessary and we don't, we don't put enough thought into that. So um, thank you. Thank you all for the, for the exchange in real time. Thank you. Absolutely. Uh, so, so with all of that said, right, um, and as we think about just the climate and everything, right, like what, what is, what are, what are words of encouragement, right, especially to any, any, any students, any young people who are on the call with, the, uh, to, with sure. us here, anybody in general, like what does it mean what does this mean for them? And like, how do we, how do we kind of maintain some sort of hope? If at all, if at well, all. Well, I, I, shout out to my friend Christina on the, on the call. She's an amazing mother. Um, I, I, I think, you know, Leslie touched on it earlier. I, I did a little bit too, but um, I, look, man, there's no one more beautiful than, than us. Um, I strongly believe that I, I, our soul, the way we move through the world, uh, the way we're able to create. Uh, the other day I was standing by the water and there was a group of people just hanging out. It was a nice day. And, you know, all sorts of people. And I just kept on watching all the Black people. And there's there something about us that is so fluid and so beautiful and so soulful um, that is so given. And, and that's just who we are. And, and I think that is strength and that is beauty. And our young people need to understand that, right? The world may not validate your beauty and who you are on a regular basis, but we know that, we feel it. Um, we engage differently than most people. Um, you know, we can make things on the spot as we go. And to me, that is what I call soul. And I think that is partly why this country is at odd with us because in a capitalist society, you measure everything by numbers, data, and statistics. Um, you measure people's value by how much they have. Well, Black folks, um, the best thing we have is our soul and who we are and what we give back to the world. And I think that 
to me, there is no greater good than that. Um, as mm. I've said earlier, we are the, we, we are fundamentally what it is to be a human being. I think black people are that. Um, and our kids, our boys, girls on this call are just that. And I think that we need to own that. We need to embrace that beauty. Um, and, 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 and a part of doing that is breaking down toxic masculinity. Um, mm. You know, I grew up in the world where I thought violence was everything. I thought that the way I look at people, the way I talk, the way I punch stuff, how angry I was, how angry I looked was what was like, you know, valuable to me. And sadly it was because of the world I lived in, but it wasn't who I, I've been. Um, and I think that it's important for our boys to cherish some of those things, even if this country is not putting a price on it that it's important that they have it and they possessed it within them. Mm. Thank you for that. Leslie, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, just because I know there are more questions. I want to make sure you get to as many as possible. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And uh, just, I don't, I'm going to ask like maybe two more questions. And I do want to turn it over to, um, to, to folks who are on this call as well, because I know they have a lot of questions uh, too. But one, one thing, and thinking about both of you as leaders, right? And um, Jim, I'll start with you uh, re really quickly. And I wanna, I wanna read this, but I wanna make sure I, I, I get this right. Um, but uh, the, 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 one thing, the one thing that, that I consistently think about and I continue to ask um, is about leadership during this time. Yeah. And um, my, uh, my manager, shout out to him, something he said to me a couple of weeks ago was that leadership is a calling. Yeah. And I, I was trying to figure out what that meant, right? Because sometimes we are going through so many different challenges, whether it's like personally, systemically, et cetera, whatever that is. And we continue to be resilient and, and move beyond that and, and somehow still figure out how to lead. Yeah. And uh, we may not always think about that, but there's something happening and there's a reason that you're being called to, to lead. And so given your experience, everything that, that you've been through and, and the things that um, you know, your child is now seen and the conversations that are happening, what inspires you to continue to lead um, in, in many of the, 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 the things that you're doing, right? Like all of the different roles that you're playing, the boards that you sit on, um, right? Some of the national orgs that you're leading, what, what inspires you to continue to move uh, and, 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 and push the work forward? Um, our kids inspire me. Um, I, I, I've been this person before I had a child. And I think it's partly due to the fact that I'm here because of someone else. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here because of other people's generosity and their ability to see things in me way before I was able to see things in myself. Mm -hmm. And I strongly, firmly believe that when you are black in this world, uh, you are a born leader. Um, the baton is being passed to you, whether you want it or not. Some people get um, to decide whether they're going to lead or not. For me, at least from my view, I don't think that black and brown people get to decide whether they're going to lead or not. Um, mm -hmm. I think that it's partly our calling, and I think we're wired that way. Um, does that mean we all should lead at all times in all different manners? I'm not necessarily saying that, uh, but I think that it's imperative that we continue to work on this quilt. My brother Edwin Raymond called it the sort of like the social quilt, right? Each generation gets to sew its own piece. And the goal is for each generation to add just a little bit to it so it gets big enough to shield us from the oppression of the world. So um, I've always viewed the work that I've done and who I've been as an individual who is simply sewing my own piece of that social quote that has been left for me by Malcolm and, 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 and Rosa and, and, and those great leaders that came before us and that made the way and willingly sacrificed their lives for us. I mean, these individuals knew they were going to die. Dr. King knew he was going to die. Malcolm X knew. Um, but yet they decided that the ultimate price was worth it. So me and Leslie and Chris and you can be on this call today and all the other young people on the line. 
And so for me, that's a responsibility that, that, that I don't take lightly. It's heavy. And once you learn that history, you learn your roots. And again, combining that with being Haitian, you know, it's just that that's leadership exem exemplified for me. Mm. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Leslie, you are a CEO, right? You have students, you have families, you have the community, you have teachers, everyone um, kind of looking up to you, right? In, in the time of need at times. And, um, you know, you spoke a little bit about how, uh, you know, you've been handling this, but I would love to learn just the same thing, right? Like what gets you going? What, what gives you that inspiration to continue to lead? Uh, strangely enough, the answer is exactly the same as Jim. I think it's the kids, families. Mm -hmm. um, I say this time and again, but um, kids that I've taught have absolutely saved my life. Um, I have had rough years, hard years for sure, and I think they have often been the ones that have kept me going. Um, so I think there's something about being in service to others that makes you understand your full possibility and your full purpose. Um, I think that's what leadership is about being in service to others. Um, speaking truth to power on behalf of others for sure. And I think some of that comes with not just a responsibility, but I think privilege creates responsibility. Um, and I definitely know that I've had a bunch of privileges in my life just by virtue of having the mother that I had, the grandfather that I had, being born into the family that I was in. Um, and that has created opportunities for me that were unearned and all privileges unearned. And I think we come from a tradition from a people that understands that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think us having that clarity gives us not only the responsibility and the purpose, but the opportunity to speak truth to others who uh, don't recognize that they need to be in service to others. Mm. Listen, I'm going to harp on that last part, Leslie, just quickly. The idea that um, certain blessings come with certain responsibilities. And that's something I practice every day, right? I look at my life. I know all the people I have access to, whether they're super wealthy or they're in positions of power. I mean, literally, before I ran into this call, I was just talking to Senator Chuck Schumer um, about a bill which we expect in this Monday regarding... Um, police accountability on a federal level. Um, and I have relationships like that with individuals like that from every sector, business, entertainment, law, whatever it is, government, I know those individuals. And when you have that level of privilege and connection and you come from where we come from, you have no choice but to exhaust it, use it as much as possible so you can create the path for one of the youngsters on this call to follow through. Thank, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and I think that uh, you guys are, are bringing up a lot. And so one thing that you're reminding me of as we're talking about this, right, is that we don't see institutional racism just in, in, in the police force, but we see them in across all industries. We see them in all, the, in all different uh, shapes and forms. And, I, and I, my personal belief is that we all have a role in dismantling institutional racism, right? And uh, this look different for everyone um but what are, what are, what are your thoughts on on that um do you do you think that people have this role and if so what are the different roles that people can play in dismantling it because they don't they not everyone's going to be on the front lines protesting not everyone is um going to uh you know to be out there but there there may be different things that they could do i got let, let me let me break it down COVID-19 is not the first pandemic that we have dealt with. Mm -hmm. It is not the first virus that has infected this planet and started in a different part of the world and then came to the U.S. where it definitely blew up. You know, the U.S. Might, likes to be number one, <laughs> right? The United States for damn sure did not invent racism. Mm -hmm. But we did a very good job of perfecting it, yep. globalizing it, and embedding it into the roots of capitalism. Yep. This country is founded on principles and bedrocks of white supremacy, right? When you spend a dollar bill, you are honoring a man who ripped the teeth out of the mouth of his slaves to replace his own. The Washington Monument was built by slaves. 
And so the entire wealth of this country, I don't need to preach to the folks on this call. We know where we come from. We know what the history is. And so there is literally not a single job in this country or on this planet that you cannot do where you're not going to come to battle with white supremacy. And so I think what can happen at times is that for our folks, for our people, we feel like to be part of the quote unquote good fight, like you have to have a certain job or a certain profession. And I strongly want to encourage folks to not think so narrow-mindedly because that is not true. Yep. We have flocked to nonprofit roles in government service because government protections made it harder for you to discriminate against folks. Yep. We are overrepresented in not-for-profits and we are overrepresented in government agencies. But we are underrepresented in literally every sector of society. So we need more black doctors so that the mortality rate for black mothers isn't so high. We need more black lawyers in the private sector to fund our candidates and to write campaigns and to pour wealth back into our communities. But we also need more black prosecutors yep. who are holding police officers accountable and not overcharging our defendants. And we need more black public defenders. There is literally not a profession in this country where we don't need more people of color. Yep. The question is like, what can we do as leaders to advance this fight and to dismantle white supremacy? And the answer is simple to me. If you believe that the master's tools cannot dismantle the master's house, then we need to be both on the inside and on the outside, bringing this shit to the motherfucking ground. Excuse yep. my French. You're fine. You're fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, Leslie. I thought you were. No, that's it. I'm, you know. Um, a short fuse right now. I just want to touch on two things real quick, and it's not a correction, Leslie, so please forgive me, but this is something I've been thinking about a lot. Um, I've been thinking about the term white supremacy. And um, for me, the word supreme means better, you know, you know, like the top of the echelon and apex. And so if someone is superior than me, then how can that person be simultaneously afraid of me and terrified of me and try to do everything to hold me down? So I say that to say, we need to call it what it is, is white inferiority, not white supremacy. I think that term itself was brand by white supremacists. People call themselves that. Um, and I think language matters. So from now on, for me, wherever I see white supremacy, I'm putting white inferiority. Um, mm. Those of you on the call, if you want to use that, feel free. I'm sure I didn't found it, but it's something I've been thinking about. The other thing is, is that that man, which you refer to, Leslie, he did not have slaves. I think he had human beings, which he enslaved. Um, and I think sometimes it's important for us to call enslaved people enslaved people rather than calling them slaves. And because I think this generation that's on this call right now, words matter to them and words means a lot and so i and and, and there's nothing else i wanted to add because leslie touched on it all but i just I, wanted to just touch on those two quick um phrases because i think they are powerful language is power i agree mm. fellas y'all are y'all are dropping so many gems right now and um i'm learning so much just by listening um you know so so definitely uh, for those who are listening please continue to think about all the terminology, your identity, your history, economic freedom, liberation, all of these different things that we're hearing about. Um, there's so much to unpack and we can't cover, cover it all here, but definitely take note of this and think about what this looks like in your lives right now. Um, the, the last question before we turn it over to uh, our participants for, for Q&A is we, we spent a lot of time really thinking about the, the state of, of where we are. Um, we spoke a lot about uh, your experiences and, and your leadership. Uh, we spoke about our young black boys and, and, and our young men and what they're experiencing and um, what this all means for them. Uh, the, the last part of this that I don't think we always get a chance to think about, especially in, in the roles that you guys occupy, um, is self-care. What does self-care look like for, for both of you? And uh, so I have a follow-up question, but I'm going I'm to I'm start there. What does self-care look like for, for the both of you? Um, I would say that I, I go straight into this. So for example, I go to therapy regularly. That's my thing and I'm proud of it and I talk about it um, and I encourage it. Um, I, you know, I grew up, obviously I grew up in a world where it wasn't available and um, there was stigma around it. But man, I'll tell you every day, every Friday at 11.45, I sit with my therapist and um, to me, that's the highest form of self-care. 
And mm-hmm. the other thing I do and I love is I'm a runner. Um, you know, so I run, you know, I run on the average 10 miles a day. Sometimes I run twice a day. Um, do a lot of calisthenics, Ooh. eat as clean as I can eat. You know, like I haven't had red meat in a while. Um, I've cut bread out of my diet. Um, when I eat rice, I'm trying to make sure it's brown and quinoa. So, um, what you know, was it, my, <laughs> quinoa, quinoa, John, John. <laughs> so, Les, as you can imagine, man, I haven't been having a good time with my Haitian food, man. <laughs> the grill I had to put aside a little bit, but every now and then, you know, I got to go back and dabble in because the Haitian mothers will slap you upside the head if you turn down that food. Um, but yeah, man, I think for me, health, um, self care is certainly taking care of my health. Um, doing the things that I that I enjoy reading. Um, obviously, things been closed down, but when things weren't closed down, I I like going to plays and um, I like traveling. I just think that we have to take care of ourselves, and we've earned these things, and we deserve them. And the sort of like martyr we have to suffer ideology is something that we need to fight and push back as a people. We need to live fully, as beautifully as we can, and we don't always have to. Um, tie identity to just struggling all the time, even though that is a part of our reality. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Leslie, do you want to chime in on this? Uh, I would just add um, exercise. Uh, so put in a plug, definitely, I think, for the mental health supports. I think they are underappreciated in our community and much respect to you for, for shouting that out. I'm still looking for a therapist. So if you have a rec, please send it along. Um, definitely exercise is big for me. I have like this home gym set up for COVID. Like I'm boxing in my apartment, anything that I can do to, to, to get me out of the house, I think is, has been helpful. So I'm riding a bicycle. Um, I think I would then say like relying on loved ones and families. Um, um, we have like a, every other week cousin call now with the folks. Um, so that has definitely been like a source of like recharging friends and i would definitely say relying on uh my girlfriend rose who definitely keeps me sane for sure mm. thank you for all of that right um self-care really important some that we don't we don't always think about but uh i think we should intentionally create space in our schedules for um right so whether that means for you that therapy whether that means go for a run whether that means have a uh, uh, take a break go take your lunch break or call it out, right? All of these different things I think are important, especially right now, um, you know, to, re- to really consider what self-care could look like for you and what it means for you. Because what, how I define it, how Leslie define it and Jim define it may be different, but I think what's important is that, that we all try to exercise um, self-care. So with, with all of that said, I do want to thank you guys for engaging in this conversation with us today. Um, as mentioned, so many gems. I want to repeat a few things that we mentioned um, as we close out. I think one is uh, economic freedom. Um, I think one is is also um, being real with our young people, right? Having a conversation, listening to them, right? Listening to what it is that they need, right? What they need us to do. Yeah. Um, I, wait, wait, uh, I, I don't know if you were going to jump in there. No, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Jason. Yeah, um, right. So listening. Um, I think it's huge. We just finished talking about self-care, um, identity, uh, really taking time to unpack who you are, what that means for you, what are your different identities, and then y- your own history. Uh, just really quickly, I know um, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican and, and Salvadorian, right? In the Latinx community, there's so many complexities when it comes to race, not ethnicity, race, right? And so I think it's really important for us to understand who we are at the root of our identity. So I just want to throw that out there again. Um, so thinking about that, and uh, am I missing anything that, that in, in ter- as we wrap up in terms of going away messages that you all shared? Jason, I just want to say real quick, I, I, I've mentioned this earlier, but I want to emphasize just real quick how important it is for our, our folks on this call, especially the young people and their parents to travel. Um, there are mm-hmm. many places around the world where Black is beautiful and accept. I mean, it is here too, but where it's not a mark on you. And I think that is very important for us to go and see these places, to see that the world looks more like us. So for example, one term I don't use is the term minority, right? Because we're not a minority, we're a majority across the globe. Um, but mm-hmm. if you've not seen it, you, you don't know it. So I think that's, that's extremely important for our young people to, 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 to get into, is to travel, to expand, um, it's crucial. 
Mm. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for adding that. Um, so, so at this time, I just want to shout out Gentleman's Factory for giving us this space, Jeff, David, um, you know, for hosting this conversation and, and um, you know, really, really allowing us to be vulnerable and talk about um, all the things that, are, that we're seeing and, and that are happening. So at this moment, I want to turn it over to you all on the call and um, to ask some questions. What we'll do is if you can type your question in the chat, um, I will uh, say your name and read the question. To our panelists and uh, they, they will then respond. I so, see in the chat that some people are, are sharing places to, to travel to. Jeff, I, were you going to say something? No, uh, wow. Yeah, I mean, so as I guess questions are coming in, you know, like I just want to say again, thank you all for this conversation. You know, like I know that uh, we're about to end shortly at, at um, at eight, uh, but the uh, things that I learned here today, I mean, it's uh, profound, right? You know, and um, it was touching to have that young man there on the, on that, um, you know, just him, ex him expressing himself, right? You know what I mean? You know, mm -hmm. like it's important for young people to just express themselves. You know, I have a uh, eight year old, oh, well, no, he's actually nine. So I have a nine year old uh, boy and, you know, uh, before, you know, he was always angry, always angry. And I was just saying, listen, express yourself, let it out, talk, right? You know, and that's um, really important. So just seeing that, and thank you, Leslie, for bringing that out of him too, right? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? In a true educator you are, you know, just always trying to get young people engaged. So, you know, like, I am just profound. Uh, like, I'm just in awe of this conversation. And um, I don't think we have any um, um, questions. So like, I guess, oh, oh wait, oh, so we have one. Okay, yep. good, good. Yep, yep, yep. So Jason, yep, take it away. Mm -hmm. All right, Leslie, this question is, is for you. Um, hearing your experience at the protest and your Stanford jacket, what are your thoughts on respectability politics? How do we navigate throughout the conversation of being looking slash dressing presentable? This is from Evelyn uh, Jean Francis. Ooh, she's, those are fighting words. Respectability politics. Go ahead, Leslie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, for me, I've always found power and privilege in being able to navigate between worlds. And so I think there are ways that I just sort of personally take advantage of my privilege to constantly disarm folks. Um, so... <laughs> on a regular day, I'm, I'm not like quite, you know, Jeff level, like I'm not like full gentleman's factory pin lapeled out, like <laughs> pocket square and everything. But I do think that there is something to be said for, um, for me, I constantly walk through this world like present and aware of this juxtaposition. And so um, the folks who know me well will know I carry both with me always. And so I go to work every single day in a suit and most days I also have on a fitted hat. And so I think for, for my kids, for instance, it is powerful to see both, like this man can both wear a suit really well. And then I also know that he knows exactly what sneakers I have on. He will also wear Tim's and things like that. And so um, I don't believe in respectability politics because I don't think there is anything that you can do that will make someone who believes that you are not human suddenly respect you, right? There are no amount of degrees that I can put behind my name. I have Princeton behind my name, Stanford behind my name twice, top law firms, top consulting firms. That actually does not matter if the only thing that you see me when you see is a threat. And so I need to both mm -hmm. own who I am a thousand percent of the time. And so um, I try to do that as much as possible. And I think that was true before I, I think I had this title, but now that I do have it, I try to extend that privilege to as many folks as possible. Um, I remember the day, the day that it was announced to like the staff at our school that I was gonna be taking over as a CEO. I knew the day that announcement was coming and that was the day I was like, I'm wearing Tim's to work today. Mm. So we're making this announcement in Tim's and jeans just in case you forgot where I came from. And the person who was most touched by that, um, it was a custodian. It was a custodian staff member who pulled me aside and was like, thank you for doing that. Like, I, w I appreciate how you 
how you made this announcement. Like it made me feel part of this organization. Um, and I think it's really easy to forget those um, who don't always come top of mind. And so um, I think what you wear, what you say, how you speak is part of that. Uh, and I'm definitely always trying to navigate both spaces. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a, another question. The way this question is framed, it looks like it might be a young person, uh, Brian Balsey. So I want to make sure I get this question out. The question is, do you think the distrust my generation has in adults comes from the desire of adults to shield their children from the whole story of what's going on and not truly resolving situations my generation finds dire? Anyone can, can take that. Jim Leslie. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, I, I think also, you know, sadly, a part of being a black man in this world is that there are times where we get to often strip naked in front of the world. And as a man who is supposed to be a provider and a protector, um, and your kid sees you as like this giant superhero and young people look up to you, and then here comes a police officer completely dehumanizing you in the streets, stopping you, searching you, or speaking to you a certain way. Um, it's, it's powerlessness in many ways. And I think a lot of times we channel that through our young people, the way we talk to them, um, the way we lecture them. Um, and sometimes we make promises that we can't keep, not because we don't want to, but again, because of the world that we live in. And that, that, that is true for all of us. I mean, a perfect example is President Obama. You're talking about credentials and all of those things. I mean, he was that and more, but yet their entire agenda was to stop him from doing anything good because he was a black man, nothing else. So yeah. I think sometimes- African and a Muslim. Yes, that's all of that, you know? So, um, so yeah, I do think that sometimes, unfortunately, we can't always keep promises we make to our young people and we move in the world in a certain ways. And sometimes we do lecture them and it doesn't always help. Um, but you know, Leslie talked on something earlier that, that I find super important myself. I've, in the last two, three years, purposely wear t-shirts and sneakers as many places as I can. Uh, mm -hmm. Because at some point I realized that I was wearing suit a lot and I love suits. Um, there was nothing like those, those three piece threads that Jeff has over there at his spot. <laughs> um, but also I, I kind of felt like I was sometimes, I want people to just accept there is something I enjoy. I enjoy walking down the streets in a t-shirt and sneakers and then on cue able to embarrass someone intellectually or mm. historically when they sort of like perceive somehow I'm not supposed to be that person. And I think there's, there's something in me that likes that underdog feeling, but then we get into a conversation and they're like, whoa, okay. Um, and I enjoy that. So a part of what I do is to project exactly just that. But, you know, to, to go back to the question the young man asks is, I, I think there is a merit of things that, 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 that enables us um, to look and do things that perhaps are disappointing to our young people. And sometimes a lot of those things we don't have a lot of control over. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, fellas, for, for coming. As Chris said earlier, though, which is why honesty is important. Right, because if we're honest with them, we listen to them, and I think that can help to subside that 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 sense of powerlessness. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing that. Um, I'm getting word from the boss man that we got to start closing out due to time. So, uh, <laughs> so so with all of that said, again, just want to thank everyone for attending and staying. Saying, uh, if, if you didn't even look at the time, we've been on together for about an hour and a half. So I do want to thank you all for being here throughout the entire time with us. Thank Lakeisha and Chris for jumping in on the spot and engaging with us. Uh, Gentlemen's Factory again, Jeff, David, Leslie, Jim, 
Uh, thank you all. Jeff, any last words uh, before we wrap up? Uh, so, you know, like, I just want everyone to give a round of applause for Jason. I don't know how you're going to do it, but it's just <laughs> doing at home, right? You know what I mean? Uh, um, uh, uh, Jason, thank you so much for this. And, um, you know, so, like, um, with um, Jim and Leslie, like, uh, with Leslie, you specifically, you know, you have over a thousand young people. How can we support? Is there anything that we could do as a community? How can we help push your agenda forward? Uh, the biggest thing I would say right now is we have a lot of families who are struggling. Um, we just this week crossed uh, the 50,000 threshold for the number of meals we've distributed to families in need. Um, we're giving out micro grants and putting cash directly in the hands of families who can't pay for their rent, families who are undocumented and don't have any way of, of receiving any kind of services from the government. Um, and so we need to buy laptops and iPads for every single kid as we prepare for more remote instruction in the fall. So even if a $5 donation helps, coneyallenprep.org slash give. Um, and if not, just telling people, spreading the news, talking about the good work that we're doing, um, every little bit helps. But thank you guys for this opportunity, most importantly. Oh, awesome, awesome, awesome. No, thank you, thank you. So remember, coneyallenprep.org slash give. And um, Jim, so I know that Father's Day is coming up. Um, what do you have to tell us about Father's Day? Mm. Oh, Jim is muted. David, if you can unmute Jim real quick. So as um, Jim is um, unmuting himself, I'm, I am going to speak for Jim. Jim has a fantastic short film uh, where it, where he produced, he wrote it, he produced it, and it's with uh, Michael K. Williams, right? Uh, and it's fantastic, and it's called Father's Day. Right? Yes. So, well, yes. Yes. So both. Um. So I have two films that are currently available right now for you to watch. Um, oh, my bad, bro. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, actually, it's funny, well, sadly enough, Every Nine Hours was my first film, which is also available everywhere right now. Amazon, YouTube, Every Nine Hours, um, which tackles police brutality and, and an interracial relationship. So it's very nuanced. And the second film, which is Father's Day, is also available online. Um, it's on Amazon and it's on YouTube. You can just watch it anywhere. Um, Leslie, your kids may love it. Um, they both short films. After Every Nine Hours. Yeah, every nine hours in Father's Day. And um, I, the other thing is, as Jeff mentioned earlier, I, I wrote a memoir, A Stone of Hope. I think many of you here can um, possibly benefit from it. It is my life story as raw and as honest as possible. And last but not least, I run a small mentoring organization, which I co-founded. It's called Plot for Youth, P-L-O-T for youth.org, preparing leaders of tomorrow. And so we're always looking for mentors. So I'm recruiting Jason. I'm recruiting Leslie as mentor. I've been trying to recruit <laughs> Jeff, but I'm going to get him. <laughs> looking to be a mentor, looking to give back to young people, please go to plotforyouth.org and, and, and help us do this work. Awesome, awesome, awesome. And uh, lastly, Jason, any plugs? I feel like I know that you got the podcast, and I know that you're uh, doing great work with NYC Men Teach. Please talk. Yes. Yes. Uh, so thank you for that. It just in terms of the podcast, recently launched a podcast um, called Live from the Bronx. It's streaming on all major platforms. And uh, a lot of what we're doing is really trying to shift the narrative of the Bronx by bringing in folks who are doing amazing work that don't get highlighted and, and hearing their real stories. And so we, we actually are releasing a, you, you mentioned police brutality. We were having this conversation. We're releasing an episode tomorrow um, with uh, one of the guys who were featured in Crime and Punishment, Richie Baez who shares his story about what it means to, to be a police officer over the last 16 years and the injustices um, that he's seen. So look out for that. Live from the Bronx, I'll type it in here. And then quick plug-in, NYC Men Teach. That's my day job. Um, a lot of our work focuses on the recruitment and retention of male educators of color. So if you know folks who are interested in teaching for the DOE or just want to get involved, um, I'll add my email in here as well. Feel free to reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Well, again, thank you all. Um, fantastic conversation. And um, let's continue building. And I know that, you know, our young people learned a lot. And um, this is an ongoing conversation. So I charge everyone here to start these conversations um, in your group chats, right? You know, uh, 
at your churches, um, in your Zoom calls, et cetera, uh, because we always need to find uh, solutions as to how we could, uh, you know, prepare our young men and women uh, for today's world. So again, thank you all so much. Please be safe. And for those living in New York City, there's a curfew. So eight o'clock, so 802, everyone needs to be home, right? You know, so, and that's a whole nother conversation for another day. Uh, but thank you all so much and you all be safe. God bless you all. David, you're fantastic. Love right. you all. Love you all. All the young people here. Love you all. No, definitely. Likewise. Likewise. Thank Take you. care. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Tisha. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you all.